Okay, well, um, good morning, everybody. We um, will get started. We've seen to have slowed down with people joining in, so we might still have a few attendees um, sign in. If, uh, as we move through the presentation, Peter will be um, pausing at a couple of points for questions, so please use the question function on the side um, of the screen to submit any questions, and, and Naomi and, and Peter will run through those as they come up. Um, and through the presentation. Um, it, we, you won't be able to unmute and, and ask a question at this stage, but if we need to get some further clarification, we'll obviously um, use that function and, and get you to have a chat with us to you know, ask the question in more detail. Um, but as we go, um, thank you for participating. Welcome to the webinar this morning about minor use permits. It's had um, quite a good, um, bit of interest from, from a range of industry groups. So we've got, um, while this is delivered by VegNet TAS, um, which is a vegetable levy funded project from Hort Innovation. Um, I know there's gonna be a few more industries that are covered today, so it'll be, it'll be good to see. Um, joining me today, I've got Naomi, who's a colleague of mine at RMCG and a consultant um, in the Launceston office, and she's been working closely with, with VegNet TAS on the herbicide resistance and integrated weed management portion of our project. Um, and in addition, we've got Peter, who'll be our main speaker today, Peter Del Santo from Ag Aware Consulting. I could spend the entire hour, I'm sure, um, regurgitating Peter's CV and discussing his range of experience, but suffice to say that he's well experienced in this area. Um, of horticulture and interactions with government. Um, and uh, I won't take up too much time, but rather just let him have his say and run through um, his experiences and his his knowledge and um, his um, wisdom, I guess, in this area and, and hear from him about how to do um, mining use permits and run through the application process. So yeah, over to you, Peter, thank you. Thank you very much, Ozzy. Good morning, all. Um, uh, I assume that all online are based in Tasmania. I'm based in Bendigo in central Victoria. And I just said to Naomi, we're about to go through a catastrophic weather day today. So I'm glad we're doing this this morning because this afternoon may be a bit more difficult. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, some of you may have seen me either in Tasmania or elsewhere, maybe in some meetings in Victoria. We used to do a lot of the work for Ausveg and their minor use program, and also then for Hort Innovations and Horticulture Australia, as it was then, uh, for all their pesticide work as well. So we've been involved in this part of agriculture, as in pest management with pesticides, uh, since 1999. So we're well versed in what happens. I'll spend um, most probably three quarters of an hour going through a presentation There'll be stages along the way where you will be able to uh, ask questions. And if you could text those questions to Naomi, we will address them at certain points. Please ask anything that you're unsure about or that I haven't answered clearly, and I'll try and address those for you. We hope by the end of this webinar that you have a good understanding. To have a thorough understanding takes a long time. To have a good understanding of the permit process the issues with pesticides in agriculture, and I'll myself refer it more to horticulture as we move along, but the issues that's facing the industry in pest management using pesticides. I thought to start off with, I'd give um, some general things, uh, some general issues with regards to pesticides that we come across regularly that um, are driving what our business is all about. And that's the key request is for more effective pesticides by, by, by growers. Um, they want to better manage existing pests. They want to tackle new diseases, insects and weeds. And that's also some exotic, particularly some exotic insects that we're getting exposed to. There's the challenges of new production areas and systems. So as your techniques improve, it might change the dynamics of pest management within your cropping system. So that introduces new challenges. We've also got um, particularly new and niche and developing crops, maybe less so in southern Australia, um, but more so in sort of some of the exotic areas, particularly sort of in the subtropics. 
we're constantly uh, looking for new systems to incorporate integrated pest management, to manage resistance, more and more pressures on us in regards to the environment and in particular water management. And then also we've got contamination of the environment, but also contamination of our food. Um, in nearly every case, we should never be looking at one pest management strategy to control a pest. We should be looking at multiple options. The problem we have when we look at the pesticide side of it is the availability of products, as in shortage, as is the case I heard with some products this year, and their suitability, but also their what, what's actually available to us, because we'll go into it a bit later. There are a lot of products that are being removed from the marketplace. The regulation of, uh, of all pesticides in Australia is by the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Association. That's the APVMA based in Canberra and um, 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 Armidale, sorry, in uh, northern New South Wales. So they regulate pesticide registration. We've got Fazenz, which reg uh, regulates residues in food. We have uh, external pressures by markets in Asia, Europe, the UK now, the US, and they're all coming under review because of pesticide reviews. There are, and I'll talk about it towards the end of this presentation, there are multiple products that you use on a regular basis. There are other some a global reviews somewhere in the world. The other thing we need to address, which is particularly those that are producing food, is residues for domestic consumption and for export compliance. And then we have the additional uh, impact on those particularly producing food crops is the quality standards and, associate, and associated costs, particularly imposed by the supermarkets that we need to address. Next one, please, Aussie. Okay, this is just, again, we're the, this, these are some of the, the pests that we're uh, or some of the issues that we're having to address regularly that we're trying to address with minor use permits. Um, and, and, and a lot of these you're really exposed to, ants, anthracnose, botrytis, uh, stink bugs, the mildews, fall armyworm, which is a major one that's happened of recent times, um, fruit spotting bug if you're up north in fr Queensland, fr uh, fruit fly, particularly sort of in central Victoria north, Mites, post-harvest rots, psyllids is a relatively new pest that's causing big issues. Uh, white flies have been around for a while, but they're major issues. So there's lots of, of, uh, of pests and diseases, less so weeds other than herbicide resistance, that we have uh, major issues with, particularly in crops that are not covered by labels, hence why we've got the access to permits. But they're some of the ones that we're our major issues that we're addressing. The other one that we're getting a lot of inquiries about is for biologicals or biopesticides, and especially for use close to harvest. So they're almost looking to use these products as cleanup sprays where there are no concerns with residues in the produce at harvest. Um, I think that is a really interesting fit. Uh, and it's one that's going to develop more and more over the next few years. Next. Um, we need to know why we have to register pesticides. Um, before any product, agricultural, veterinary chemical, uh, can be legally supplied, sold or used in Australia, it must be registered by the APVMA. For farmers, food producers, the chemical industry and the general public, Registration means the product is safe and will work when used according to the label. Now, the word safe doesn't mean it has no toxicity. We'll address that a bit later. But it is, let's say, an acceptable safety for the benefit when used according to the label. And at last bit, used according to the label is critical. Now, what needs to be registered? All compounds that have a biological activity on an organism. So it can attract, control, enhance, kill, modify, promote, reduce, repel, suppress. Everything that has an impact on an organism and is used in food, fiber, meat, amenity productions, 
roadsides, etc., must be registered by APVMA. Um, they're tasked with looking at these compounds, which is both pesticides, so synthetic chemicals, and also biopesticides and also biologicals. They'll look at them for efficacy, crop safety, residues, particularly for food, trade, particularly for food, toxicity in the environment. Now, all these evaluations are based on science. They need hard data. And we'll address that a bit later on when we come to applying for permits. Um, they'll assess these products on all the crops to be registered and how good agricultural practice, which is basically the use pattern and the residues, which is the maximum residue limits are applied. Now, most of those, most of you people listening that produce food will know the MRLs associated with you using a pesticide in a crop, the withholding period, and then what the residues are. The residues in food is not a food safety issue. Um, it's a misconception by, I'll say, the majority of, of the community. MRLs are based on the science that's been provided for that registration. So that, that is determined by the rates you've used, how often you've used it, the withholding period, the breakdown of the product, and then you have an MRL. So it's, MRLs are based on science, not on food safety. By purchasing a registered product, the, you know as a consumer that they have been assessed for su as suitable under Australian conditions. You are complying with the law, which is important, and when you're used according to the label, that they will not have an adverse effect on you, your family, your workers, your crop and animals or the environment. So basically, that's our, the, the APVMA is our safeguard that we use uh, safe products or products in a safe way. Now, to register a, a, um, to register a pesticide, it can only be done by the Adkin company, people like BASF, Syngenta, FMC, Bayer, they're the only people that can register a product. They must have data, and when they submit that data for registration, they have data protection, which basically gives them exclusive access to that data and that registration for a period of time. Um, if there's a product that's already registered and the and the registration, it's sort of the data protection has expired. So it goes from being a proprietary product to a generic product, then they can copy it or image it. And you'll see in the marketplace, there must be 100 different types of glyphosates. It used to be Roundup once, and now there are, as I say, hundreds of glyphosates. There are hundreds of spray seed equivalents. There are hundreds of fusillate equivalents. There are hundreds of Megazip equivalents. So they're all being imaged from the original registration after the data protection expired. Um, for a new active, um, let's just say a brand new, I'll use a fictitious example, a brand new knockdown herbicide that has, so a, say for example, a new type of glyphosate, not a glyphosate, but a new, a new knockdown herbicide. For someone like, say, a Bayer to register, they need efficacy, crop safety, residues, uh, livestock data, as in feeding study data and trade data. That could cost them up to nearly a $2 million package. That's for Australia only. The work will take three to eight years to conduct. Um, and the problem is the more uses a product has, like a knockdown herbicide, the more data you need to generate, the higher the cost. Then you've got the APVMA assessment time, which is 12 to 18 months, depending on the, the data package and it can cost up to $126,000 per, per product. So the whole, and then, the, then uh, for this new product, they'll have eight to 12 years of data protection. So you can see it takes a long time and it takes a lot of money to bring a new product to Australia. One thing where things have changed over the past 10 years is called global data registrations, where rather than the APV may looking at efficacy, crop safety, residues, et cetera, that where a new product is registered around the world, they, they, one country will assess residues, one country will assess data, the efficacy, one country will assess crop safety. So it's data sharing across multiple countries. 
The benefit of that is, is obviously reduced cost and reduced timelines, but also we also can pick up additional crops. Um, some of you may, may know the product Corrigin, uh, which is the active ingredient is chlorantranopril. That went through data global registration and Australia picked up about half a dozen to a dozen new crops, although there was no work ever done on those crops in Australia. So that's one of the benefits of global data registration. So it's economical to, for the company, but also benefit to the, the growers in each country to go through this process. Unfortunately, it's getting less popular of the past year or two, and I'm not sure if COVID had something to do with that, but um, it, it's, it, where it has worked, it's worked extremely well. Next, please. So if we want to change the label, let's say we want to put, I'll pick another, let's say we want to put hemp onto a, onto a label. The only people that can add a new crop to a label is the company who owns that product. So um, we can provide data to that company as an association or as individuals to say, can you investigate this? But in general, that's based on economics within the company and only they, and only they can do it. So they'll add new crops um, or a new pest. They'll add changes to rates for maybe for new production systems or for, so for using it in a greenhouse or protecting cropping. And they'll add new directions for use, et cetera. So only the company can do that. But sometimes there are things outside a company's control that are required to be changed. And that's where the APVMA steps in if there are new safety directions. For example, we've just gone through a massive review for uh, chlorpyrifos, which is the old trade name Lawsban. There are new safety directions that have gone into that label and crop changes, but that's driven by the APVMA and that has to be done by the man. The, the APVMA directs the ag chem company to do it. And as you may have seen in the past, spray drift requirements have gone on to labels, uh, buffer zones have gone into labels. So that's all been driven by the regulators and directed to go on every label. But my question always is, how do you find out about these changes? And that's always been the difficult part. If something changes, how do you know? And I'll pause there for a minute to see if there's any questions. Thanks, Peter. Um, really good overview there. Um, Speaking of registrations, there's one question here. Um, can you explain why it's not always the responsibility of a chemical company to provide minor use permits or support for minor use permits um, and new registrations? Okay, um, that's a couple of parts there. Um, we have, to, to give you an example, we've been running permit work since 1999, basically. That's when it all really started. Um, Akin companies' priority are, I'll address this later on, per permits are generally not supported because they're generally in minor crops or it's a minor pest, hence the minor in that minor use permit exercise. I'll explain that a little bit more later on. Um, most Akin companies' focus is big dollar sales in major crops. So we're looking at wheat, barley, oats, canola, um, apples or palm fruit, stone fruit, brassicas, etc., mangoes, macadamias. We're not looking at um, poppies. We're not looking at hemp. Um, we do a lot of work in minor crops, so we're not looking at cocoa. We're not looking at essential oils. It takes nearly as much resources, not, not cost, but nearly as much resources to add poppies to a label as what it does to add stone fruit to a label. You're looking at sales of five drums versus 5,000 drums. I'm just making that up, but that's where we get a lack of support. There's also philosophies, policies within some companies that they will never support minor use. And that's a global issue that comes through. And there are a couple of companies that are in Australia that have that philosophy, so they will never support minor use. Um, whereas some companies are very, very good and add uses to labels 
as long as the data is available quite regularly. So it's a horses for courses. Um, in general, though, as a generalisation, they don't support minor use because it's time consuming and it costs money for little return. It's all economics. Yep, thanks for that. Um, no, one sorry, did I address all that, Naomi? Did I, get all, did I answer all those points? Yes, thank you. Uh, one more question, um, but I think you might be explaining this as we move on. Um, if uh, an individual or an organisation bankrolls all of the trials in order to get a money use permit, are they able to stipulate who can use the permit legally? I'll address that later. I'll address that specifically later on, yeah. I'm happy to move on now. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to target in on um, on permits specifically. What I'll do is um, go through how you go about it, who does it, what you need to have, the reasons for it, the likelihoods of success, uh, etc. So we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time on this, and I, this is all just. I, I think the principle of what this webinar is about will be in the next half a dozen or so slides. Okay. Um, before you can apply for a permit, and that's the actual physical part of applying for a permit, which is all online now to the APVMA, you need to be an eligible or a um, an eligible person or an entity. Um, if you've got a criminal record, forget it, you can't do it. If you're being bank, um, if you're being bankrupt, I think you can't do it. There's about a 10 different things where you can't do it. So you need to register your eligibility and acceptability with APVMA. And you do that on you gotta register for that and then you then you're able to apply for permits. Um, the people who can apply for a permit are industries, for example, the um, Australian Hemp Council uh, or associations. Um, the Department of Agriculture can, consultants can like ourselves, and an individual can, as in individual growers, etc. cetera. Um, generally, and we might address, well, I will address this now, um, ag chem companies cannot apply for a permit except in exceptional circumstances. Um, so I'll address that a little bit more later on. So ag chem companies generally can't apply for permits. The APV mate can accept, must accept all applications, but it doesn't mean that all accepted applications are approved. So that's a, a key thing that you need to remember. They must accept them, they may not approve them all. So the reasons that we apply for a permit, it allows a pesticide to be legally used in a situation that is not covered by the label. That's what we're doing. So we're saying um, there's, um, I'll use hemp because I know the Tasmanian hemp grower, so I apologise for the others. But hemp is not on the glyphosate label, so let's try and get it on the on, – it's not on the label, so let's apply for a permit. So that's what we're trying to do, put a – legalise a use which is not currently on the label. So you can – we need to control a new insect, disease, weeds or other pests, crop situations. So if we want to go into – if we want to – we've got an existing registration and there's a new pest, a new uh, target we need to chase, then that's why you apply for a permit. Um, or if there's a new crop, the crop that's not on the label, you also want to apply for a new permit. So that's a new situation. We need to have efficacy, crop safety, residues, livestock, wildlife, trade, as in uh, domestic and in export trade, and or environmental data is required. Not necessarily all of it, but often some of it. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later on. We can also have permits for emergency situations, which are new pests coming into the country. Um, examples of that is the serpentine leaf miner, which came in a little while ago, um, the psyllids, the brown marmorated stink bug, fall armyworm, all these new pests, and to a degree varroa mite in bees, um, are situations where we could apply for an emergency permit. Um, an, an emergency permit doesn't imply something you need straight away, which is often I get requests for a situation where I've sprayed a crop, 
the, the product they used wasn't on the label. I've got a residue. I need an emergency permit to justify that use. That doesn't apply. An emergency is sold for a new pest into the country or predominantly for a new pest into the country. Um, we can also apply for permits where there's been a biological change in the pest or the or the um, or the pesticide and it's predominantly resistance. Um, we can apply for a permit if we've lost a product. CRP can, stands for the Chemical Review Program, which is what APVMA are running on multiple products, which we'll explain a bit more later on. So if all of a sudden we lose chlorpyrifos as a early post-emergent wire weed control in poppies, and I apologise, I'm making all of this up. As an example, if you've lost chlorpyrifos, what can you use? And that's when you can apply for a permit in that situation. And you can apply for a permit in that situation even in a major crop, not just a minor crop. You can apply for a registration where, apply for a permit where registration is unlikely. And I've been told that some people are chasing Sakura in poppies. Sakura is one of my, some of the biggest used herbicides in the cereal industry. Are they going to look at poppies at such a small area? Maybe not. So the permit is highly likely to be successful with the appropriate data in that situation. And the other one which is becoming more and more prevalent that we're getting questions for is because of trade barriers. Not so much barriers, but trade viol uh, residue violations. We're exporting food overseas and we're using herb uh, products in Australia, pesticides in Australia, which have different residue limits in the, in the trade of country we're exporting to. So we need, so we have to change products we're using in Australia to match where we're exporting to. Uh, so that's becoming a big issue. And as I've already mentioned, um, biopesticides, we're looking to put them more and more into new crops, new uses and new crops, particularly close to harvest. But the other thing we're looking to do is we've got a category of herbicides, which is generally called reduced risk pesticides. So they're still conventional pesticides, but they're lower risk. And we're looking to substitute those into situations where a higher risk product was previously used. And that risk is to uh, the operator, the consumer, the environment, livestock, et cetera. We're trying to take away some of those risks and putting in a reduced risk product. So there's some of the reasons that you can use to apply for a permit. Next. Okay, the type of crops we can go to, and this will talk about the major and minor. Now, we are applying for minor use permits. The word minor is important because that means that something needs to be minor. Now, the easiest is for the crop to be minor, beetroot, poppies, pyrethrum, hemp. Um, wheat is not a minor crop. Lettuce is not a minor crop. Um, um, stone fruit, palm fruit are not minor crops. Uh, so there's a, there's a list of crops that APVMA set out which are major or minor. And some crops move from being minor, and the classic example is um, brassic, the brassica leafy vegetables, the Asian veg, used to be a minor crop. And minor is based on acreage, value, consumption. There was one other fact, and I can't think what it is. So there's three or four criteria that determines major and minor. And the Asian greens were a minor part of the Australian diet, and now they're a significant part of the Australian diet. So that crops can move from major to minor. But we can have a minor use in a major crop, slaters in onions, loopers in lettuce. So it only happens in Launceston. It only happens in Bendigo. It only happens in Gippsland. Um, if it's a localised pest, we can, we can go, we can apply for a permit for that pest in a major crop. And generally the, the major crops have got listed there, brassicas, cucurbits, tomatoes, lettuce, a lot of the vegetables in our major crops, pine fruit, stone fruit, almonds, pasture as a category is a major crop, uh, roadside sort of, sort of spraying weeds along the road are major crops. Um, and then you have the other situations where you might need data for field use and also protected cropping use. Um, if we're going to go for field and protected crops, say, for example, tomatoes, um, then you need data for both those situations. 
because the residues in those two situations are significantly different. The types of permits we can apply for, an item 20 is a renewal, which is an existing permit that's about to expire. You can apply for a renewal, which is relatively straightforward. Most permits we apply for in our business and most permits that APV may hold are for minor use. And that is, for example, um, a permit in hemp, a permit in poppies, permit in perithrum. So they're the minor use permits. And we also hold, uh, we must obviously hold um, 10 emergency permits. And they've been for uh, serpentine leaf minor, the fall armyworm, brown marmorated stink bug. So they're those new pests that have come into the country. We must have got 10 or 12 permits that for different industries in those situations. The APVMA had a project which is just finished where they tried to convert as many permits, and there's about 1,500 of them, into label registrations. So they had a program that ran for about five or six years where they asked, where they had enough data associated with the permit for the, for the use to go onto a label. Um, they've converted 257 applications onto product labels. So now that's more than 257 permits. It was about 500 permits because uh, some of the applications overlap. So it was a, it was a relatively successful program. I would have liked it for it to continue, but there's been a redirection of resources within the APVMA. Um, but that's been a good program to get to get rid of some of the permits because there were too many. Um, that's what I was after. What's it? Uh, what's the process? Well, the process is um, extensive, and you need to be pretty well organised. Um, you as growers, individuals, associations, etc., need to initiate it and need to prioritise it. Um, th this is the way we set timelines within our business to, to uh, get get a permit done. So, and, and I'll use Agawera as an example, and I, and I apologise again, but I'll use the hemp industry as an example. Hemp industry comes to Agawera and says, we need a permit for a seed dressing in hemp for seedling emergence. They need to prioritise it. We then do a market assessment, see if it's a genuine need, what options are available, have they picked the best product, uh, have we got sort of the likelihood of that being successful, is it a major or minor crop, is it only Tasmania, is it nationwide, etc. Then we need to start looking for data. And this is, this is the bit that's critical. And as I said at the very early part of the presentation, APVMA is a science-based organisation. They will not give us a permit for um, apron as a fungicide in hemp to control seedling diseases based on our, our, our wanting it. They will only issue it if there's data associated with it. So there's two ways to get data. Either we generate it ourselves, and that's in the hemp industry needs to generate it, so they need efficacy, safety, livestock, trade, data. And that can take six to 18 months to generate it, depending on the timelines and how many seasons work we need. Then we need to analyse the produce from that data. I'm sorry, hemp's not a great one, although they do use hemp for, uh, for food. So we then analyse the seed for residues. We've got to look at good laboratory practices that need to be to an international standard. And then need to see how long that those residues stay in the product over time, which is storage stability. So that's another six to 18 months. So that's if we generate the data locally. The other way we can do it is to access data from the manufacturer. So we'll go to Syngenta and ask them for apron data in hemp, and they'll say we've got none in Australia, but we've got some from the USA or Canada, and they'll send us that data. If that use pattern is relevant, then we have a potential viable permit application, if it's relevant. We'll ask the manufacturer for their support, and that's generally a letter of support to say they support the use. Um, we ask for co-funding, but they always say no. Um, so once we've got either local or overseas data to support the science that we need, we've got the support from the manufacturer. 
Now, it, it, let me stipulate a point here. We can apply, particularly for proprietary products, um, we can ask for the manufacturer for their support. They may say no. Um, we can't short circuit that system and apply for the permit anyway, um, because the, the manufacturer might say, we don't want our products going to that market because of X, Y, Z. Um, it's resist a resistance risk issue. It's It's got a disease profile or an insect profile that we don't, I'm confident with. So a manufacturer can legitimately not support a permit and that kills the permit. In most cases, that doesn't happen. So we've got all our data, we then prepare the application and that, depending on the complexity, can take up to a couple of months. We submit the application online to APVMA and they take six to 12 months to, apply, to assess it. So you can see if everything goes really quickly, it's a minimum of nine months. It's as long as 36 months. And it can cost up, if, particularly if we have to start generating data locally, it can cost up to $140,000. It's generally less than that because we can generally get data from a manufacturer from either Australia or overseas. Um, Aussie, can I ask you to bring up the questionnaire um, document that I provided you with, please? Yep, sure thing. So. While Aussie's getting that sorted, Peter, do you mind if I ask a couple of questions that have come in? Yep. So, um, speaking about data that's protected by um, ag chem companies, um, if it's within the data protection period, are they under any obligation to provide that data or are they ever under any um, obligation no. to provide that data or is it just if it benefits them? Then they want to. Data, protection, data protection protects that company from someone else using that data to, to image that registration. They can provide that data to us for a permit, but it's still, even when we provide it, provide it to us as a permit, and generally it's not the whole data package, it's summary data. We use that summary data for permit application that is still protected within APVMA. We, we sign confidentiality agreements with people so we can't give it away to anyone else. Cool. So, yeah. um, and are there limitations on the number of times you can renew a permit? Uh, APVMA gets grumpy after about four times. Um, um, and that, yeah. So, 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 yeah, so if, if it's a really minor use or there's never any likelihood of a permit being added to a label, they will continue to renew it but generally if it's a proprietary product or it's a, a significant use then they'll say after three or four times you need to put onto a label and that um sort of ties into another question that we got um there appears to be some variation in the duration of permits issued by the apvma most tend to be issued for three to five years i'd be interested in any insights you might have as to how the duration of permits is decided by the apvma I'll address that later because I've got that point specifically. Okay. The last um, question was in the application process, can you uh, run any of the data processes concurrently to shorten yes. the duration of yeah. uh, Well, so that uh, particularly that APV moment where it was, uh, what did I have, six to nine months, six to 18 months, that actually already is overlapping. There are already processes running over the top. Um, so, yeah, it's already accounting for that. Great, right, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I've just realised that we don't have a lot of time left, so we have to start scooting. This is, and and, they, and um, Naomi is, and Ozzy have got this document. This is just something I'll put together. So when someone requests a document, this is just the crop. It just helps for you as thinking about a permit, helps cement what you want to do, what you need to do. And ask questions, the crop, the pest, et cetera. Where is it a problem? Um, do you have any data? Who's going to be the permit holder? There's a whole range of questions. When do you want to use a product? What is the product? Uh, have you got any company support? So that's that's just something that's really simple um, that helps cement what you want in your mind and help anyone trying to per permit application. Thanks, Ozzy. Let's yeah, go back so to the presentation. I'm going to start talking quickly. Yeah. 
Cool. Just to clarify that questionnaire, that's not an APV may requirement, but that's someone rings no. you up and says, all yeah. oh, right, Peter, yeah. I need your hand with a permit. You'll send that to them to get the yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yep. Excellent. Cool. No worries. Let's go back. Excellent. Cool. Um, so that's a my news permit. Let's go to the next one, please. Okay, emergency permit, exactly the same data requirements, except everything stops and we do an emergency. Um, we discussed this with APV made before we apply for it to make sure that it's a genuine emergency. We need to have sort of a letter of, um, of uh, approval by a Department of Agriculture. They'll determine if it's, a, it's an emergency. But we still then need data. We still need efficacy, crop safety, particularly if it's a new pest. If it's a new pest in Australia, it's an existing pest somewhere overseas. So we'll be able to get overseas data to support it from the manufacturer. But you can see the timelines are dramatically different because all resources are diverted towards it. APVMA does the same. They, do, they go from a six to 12 months to a one to four weeks. And the costs, as you can see, come down dramatically. Now, the reason those costs come down dramatically is because we're not generating any data locally and there's no APVMA fees associated with emergency permits. So that's just the specific one. Um, now, this will address some of those issues that have been raised by some of you. Um, a permit has a specific effective date. So it'll have the dates that it was issued, the date that it expires. Those permits are generally two to five years. Now, sometimes um, there, and some, someone has asked, why is, it, why is it 18 months? Why is it one year? Why is it two years? And some are 10 years. That's to do generally with the products that we're asking for and the data associated around it. An emergency permit is generally only issued for one to two years, tops, because if it's still an emergency after two years, then it's no longer an emergency. Sorry, if the product's still being used after two years, it's no longer an emergency, so it has to be converted to a minor use permit. Generally, when permits are issued for two to three years, it means that APVMA requires data, new data, to be more confident of reissuing the permit. So you might have provided overseas data. It might have been very similar, but not exactly what was being used in Australia. So they'll say, we need two residue trials in this crop with the current use pattern to support this permit. Once they have that data, they generally issue it for a minimum of five years. So they're the real reasons that they do it. One of the other reasons why permits are issued for a short period of time is because that product is going under review or is under review by APVMA. And I'll have a quick list of those a bit later on. So if a, permits, if a product is under review, they can't issue a long permit because the review findings might find that that product needs to have its uses changed. So that's why sometimes they're much shorter. I um, hope that addresses those questions about long, the longevity of permits. The permit holder, as I said, has to be a responsible permit. That permit, that permit holder has to correspond with APVMA if there's any changes with the use pattern of the permit or issues with the permit, but it's also a point for APVMA to correspond with. Um, who can you issue the permit to? You can, persons generally is the term that APVMA use. That means anyone can use that permit. Or you can issue a permit to persons associated with the permit holder or contracted by the permit holder. So that makes it very specific to that person only. Or if you have, as I mentioned earlier, you only have um, a problem in the Launceston lettuce area or the Burnie lettuce area, then it could be for Burnie region only. Um, so you can you can have an open permit to allow to everyone to use or restrict the use to just a few people. Some permits are issued to members of an association only. That restricts it as well. The other one that sort of confuses people at times is the products that can be used. And this is a plaud, which is a um, an insecticide. Some labels will say a plaud is the only active ingredient. So that means the only product can be used is a plaud. You can't use other forms of bupropisin. Generally, it will say a plaud plus other registered products containing 440 grams per litre of bupropisin. That means all formulations of bupropisin with 440 grams can be used. 
So again, you can have it open or restricted. The directions for use uh, are basically like a, min, a mini version of a label. So it's got the use pattern, it's got the crops with and without limitations, the pests, the rates, etc. Next one, please. Got critical comments, application timing, frequency, restrictions, buffer zones, etc. It has protections. It has do nots, has lots of do nots. It has conditions if it's relevant for bees and for waterways. So you can't, um, you can't, you can't do a do not because that's still a violation. So you have to be careful about that. Uh, it's got withholding periods as it would on a label. It says do not harvest for one day after the last application. And I'll have generally have a grazing recommendation as well. Now that is determined. The withholding period for the crop and for the grazing is determined by the um, by the science that we provide them with. And then you've got the jurisdictions. It's available for all states for all states except Victoria, because Victoria has a different legislation. You can say Tasmania only, Northern Tasmania only, Burnley only. So you can make it as wide or as narrow as you like, depending on the pest that you're targeting. And then we'll have additional conditions, crop safety comments, trade comments, etc. Next one, please. So it's basically a, a mini version of a label, which is exactly what it is. So to be successful in applying for a permit, um, and this is some of the take-home points. You've got to be specific and accurate. Don't generalise, and I'll talk about the generalise. So you've got to be specific and accurate. You need to register with the APVMA as a permit as a as a permit applicant. You need your your details is obvious, but you'd be surprised at um, how vague some people are. You need to provide lots of information that needs to be accurate, so they can contact you if they need to. You need to specify the crop. So you can't just say leafy vegetables. You got to specify the leafy vegetables. Um, most crops, sort of poppies, hops, uh, hemp is specific. But it, yeah, when you're talking some other crops, you can't generalize. The pest needs to be accurately identified. So it's a common name and the scientific name. You got to have information on the impact of the pest and the losses associated with that impact. You got to have lots of information on the product you want to use. Um, so you just, it would be unwise to use things like glyphosate. You'd be better off saying Roundup, brackets open, glyphosate, close brackets. So specify a product because then you can say Roundup, glyphosate and other formulations of glyphosate. So specify a product. You need to have directions for use and that basically means a, a mini version of your label. Um, when you use it, how you use it, the rate, the, the, the spray intervals, the withholding period. You need to have all that information available. Um, so can you go back? So I just that's it. You need to have company support, and that might be just a letter of support. And then you need to have the data. APVMO, even though you might have the biggest emergency in the world, APVMO will not issue you a data unless you've got scientific information. Avoid generalizations. And the generalizations such as I've tried it on my paddock once and it worked really well. That's not going to get you a permit. So you need scientific data. Next one. Um, the benefits, uh, you get a, you get a, you can address a genuine need where there isn't one. You meet compliance standards. That means you can continue to um, use your product in a safe way. You can manage existing and new pests. Uh, it allows you to access to current pesticides. And for some industries, that's all they've got is permits. Um, it allows you to process where no company will provide you support. It allows for quick access. To, the, the thing about permits is it's relatively quick compared to registration. So particularly with the loss of old pesticides, it gives you that, that benefit. And allows for pest management in new crops. And allows for the control of new and changing pests, plant pests. And it's a mechanism to addressing residue non-compliance. Although, as I say, um, Non-compliance means you've already sprayed uh, a permit. You won't get a permit quick enough to address that issue. The problem with it is you have a, a limited. They have a limited life, as we've mentioned, and they need for constant management. I'm happy to leave it there, and if there's questions, we'll address them. Um, 
And if there's other things that people raise, I might be able to go to the presentation and address some of those issues. If that's okay with Aussie and Naomi. Yep. I've got a couple of questions here for you. So just on those last few things you were talking about. Um, when you're talking about providing evidence around the impact or crop losses, um, what sort of proof do you need? Are commercial instances of crop losses significant enough in order to get a permit? Um, how's best to record them? And would our department or peak bodies need to support us in that instance? Field, field observations are perfect, but it can't, it needs to be um, not a scientific paper, but it needs to be sort of a written, uh, and it's only going to be via observation, this scientific information, or, or at harvest. It needs to be written in a way that's easily interpretable and makes and makes sense. So inspected a crop on day one, by da uh, all okay. By day five, noticed some chewing of the outer leaves, noticed X pest. Uh, by day seven, it was 50% of the crop. By day 15, it was 30% of the crop. So you need that sort. Now, if you can involve a Department of Agriculture person to assist you with that, it adds weight to it um, and my survey gives it more credibility. It shouldn't, but it does. Um, so, that's, so that's the way to do it. It, it. it needs to be written in a logical form. Um, so you need to have when the plant when the crop was planted, you need to correct the issue is correctly identify the pest, and then you need to identify the damage. Um, you need to say if you if you then sprayed with a product and it didn't work, then you need to document that sort of information as well. So photographs and dates of the yeah. spray can photographs are great. Yeah. Now yeah. remember APVMA are predominantly scientists, they're not agriculturalists. Yes, they know what a lettuce is, but they don't know what a brown marmorated stink bug is. So if you can give them pickies, particularly of a pest chewing on a leaf, and that pest is new to you, and that leaf is maybe a lettuce leaf, so they're familiar with it, and you can see the damage, fantastic, brilliant. And that's almost the best way to document. It's one of the best ways I feel to document the losses in your crop is a photo journal. Of, but you need you need to explain it as well as to what's going on. That's great. So uh, crop commercial crop losses are just as valid as trials. Yeah. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, and, and if you started to add to that, Naomi, if you find that um, I'm trying to think of an example. If there were loss, like losses from a, a chewing bug, like a fall armyworm is quite obvious, but if you get something that's retarding the crop and you think it's a soil disease, you can say, okay, you think it's scleric, I'm picking another fictitious example, it's sclerotinia or it's fusarium and my lettuce aren't growing and I've used product X and it hasn't worked. You can take harvest yield results to say, okay, I didn't have the disease in this patch, I was getting a ton an acre, and in this patch, I'm getting half a ton an acre. And I put that down to the mould that's sitting around on the soil surface of my lettuce crop. So, again, you can do it at different stages. It doesn't have to be in the crop, it can also be at harvest. And that goes with picking fruit as well. Yep. No, excellent. Thank you. Um, another question here was there are very few products uh, permitted um, or registered in vegetable seed production crops, yeah. which I'm sure you're aware are significant um, crop in Tasmania. Can products yeah. registered yeah. in vegetable crops be used on seed crops? For example, can Spiritetramat 240SC, which is registered in onions, be used at all on an onion seed production crop? Okay, the I had a look at that example this morning and I looked at the Movento label and another label. Onions is on the label and registered. It talks about two applications per crop. It talks about um, a spray interval and it talks about a withholding period. The withholding period is also always for harvest to produce food. It's not to produce seed. I could find no, what you're looking for is do nots. I could find no do nots on the Movento and another product label that excluded use on seed crops. So the answer is yes, you can use it on a seed crop, but you're still bound by the same 
parameters of the label to applications. I think it was a 14-day respray interval. Um, the harvest is not relevant because it's a seed crop. Um, but but that's for that specific example. There are, might be other examples where it says do not apply to seed crops. So you need to be you need to be specific to each label. Um, and it's always in the do nots particularly. <coughs> Um, and that sort of leads to the last question I had, which was, um, what are the consequences for using pesticides off-label? Uh, how is this monitored and managed by um, the APVMA? Uh, it's actually not monitored by APVMA, it's monitored by state governments. They're, um, um, it's called, the, well, it used, I'm not sure what it's called now, but it used to be called the mar market basket surveys. So they will take samples from the markets and residue mm -hmm. tests. Now, everything at the markets has a producer on it and they will determine if those res there are residue violations or not. To give you a horrifying example, um, I'm going back pre-COVID now, was so obviously a fair while ago, 20% of all herb samples had residue violations. Um, you could say that's horrendous, but the principal reason was there are very, very few products registered in herbs and for growers to manage, they still have similar sort of pests to a lettuce or a celery or something else. They had to use something, so that's where the residue violations. But there are, there, are, um, there are monitoring programs and the supermarkets have a very thorough monitoring program and they use residue detections as penalties to growers. Um, so that's yes, that's an issue that the the reason for permits, the reasons for registrations, the reasons for MRLs, the reasons for all of it for the APVMA and food standards, food and for ZANS, is to make sure that we're doing everything right. Yep. Um, so there are penalties for doing it. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Peter. Right. Cool. We're we're right on ten thirty now. We've got a few more questions that have come through, so I'll, we'll, we'll we'll stick around and answer those. But I understand there'll be people who do need to shoot through. Just a reminder: there's a handout um, section here in the webinar, which has got the presentation slides and some additional documents. So so jump in and grab them. We'll also be looking at, at putting together some some further resources out of this webinar as well. Uh, it has been recorded. So if you need to get the recording and, and have a look at some of these details in a bit more depth and, and hear back more from Peter, that, um, they'll be available. Uh, there will be a quick survey at the end of the webinar. So either when you log out or as we close it up, that survey will come live. Um, if you don't fill it in at the end of the webinar, please fill it in very soon because that helps with our reporting processes internally and, and making sure that we're doing a good job and continuing to, to deliver some um, useful information to people. Um, so I will launch into some questions, but the first one just, just popped in then was the web, where will the webinar be available? We'll be posting it on the TAS Farming Futures website um, with VegNet in that VegNet project section. Um, but Keep an eye out on social media and stuff that um, the VegNet channels, and we'll we'll let you know once it's there. So thank you for that quick question. Um, so as we move on, the the question here for you, Peter, is we we've got residue and efficacy data. In terms of safety data, what's that? That's a fairly broad umbrella term. What does that actually mean? What do we need? Uh -huh. It's crop safety. So what it means that if you're using, if we were, if we're having to run a trial, um, again, I'll use a this example again. We're wanting to use fusillade on poppies. This is example. Uh, the label rate to control um, um, rye grass, which is a bad example because of resistance, but let's use rye grass is a litre per hectare. Um, crop safety data, if we were running a trial to get that permit, um, we would say we would apply one application of fusillade 
to poppies at a litre per hectare and then again at two litres per hectare. And we'd check it for chlorosis of the leaves, stunting of the leaves, et cetera, just any impact on the crop at that time at the label rate and twice the label rate. Now, if we don't, if we've got information at the label rate at one litre per hectare, that will generally be enough to get us a short-term permit, maybe two to three years. APV may, may ask for data for the double label rate because the double A rate is potentially where you overlap a spray. Um, um, and that's why they want the two X rates. So they may ask for additional data at a two X rate down the track. So crop safety is for safety is generally crop safety. Generally for permits, we're applying for a product that's already registered in Australia. Uh, and let's use the example of Fuselade. It's already got uh, livestock grazing information. It's already because they use it in pastures, they use it in pine fruit, they use it in legumes. Um, they've already got environmental data. They've always got already got water data. So we're there's a lot of the information we already have that's in sitting with, in that case, Syngenta, that they can provide APVMA with to support our application. What they don't have in this case is an application of fuselade on top of poppies because it's new to Australia or it's new to the Southern Hemisphere. So we've got no information on that. We know that fuselade controls weed, grass weeds, so that's that's a tick. We really don't need efficacy data because it's already on the label for that use, so that's fine. Generally, what we'll need is crop safety and residues. Yeah. Okay. So, so just really fleshing that out a little further, when when we're applying for a permit with a registered product, yep. And the APVMA already has all that sort of environmental and livestock grazing yep. and yep. even sort of work health safety and and material handling yep. Yep. safety information. Do we still need to grab that? and no. supply it back to them, or no. that's all the assumption it, it, it that they've state, got it? With. What we state within the application is this product is already registered in a number of crops. Again, um, um, let's use um, let's use poppies as an example again. Uh, Fuselade is already registered, or it's fluazofop, is already registered in a number of crops. The time of application of um, fluazofop or fuselade in poppies is similar to its use in uh, canola, uh, to which APVMA already has information on environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yep. th that's what we and and APVMA could refer to the registered label for these for this criteria. So that's the sort of information that's that we state, uh, and it's called the, um, the um, not toxicology, just environment. There's different categories, but it's in, under environmental. It's under human health. You just put the, almost the same statement. In each one, which is what we do. Yeah, yeah, excellent, cool. Well, the so the then, only time um, you would have to address that. Sorry, Oz, the only time you need to address that no. is we've got a unregistered product coming into the country. So it's a new product that's being developed in the country for a brand new pest. Um, the the only the, the most recent example, which is not relevant to Tasmania, was when fire ants first came to Queensland. Um, there was a new product called Poproxifen, whose trade name I think is Admiral. And Admiral was being developed in Australia. I can't even think who by then. We had some of that. We had we were doing work with them at the time. So we got a permit for fire ants for an unregistered product. Um, but that the data package with that was monstrous and that needed the full support of the manufacturer. Um, yeah. So sort of that was the collaboration, a close collaboration with the manufacturer. So, so that yeah, generally that's generally won't happen with uh, with right. one of your firms. Yeah, excellent. Um, so another question here is, how does the APVMA work with Codex to have chemicals allowed for similar importing countries? So, okay, we um, we 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 uh, are members of Codex. For those who don't know, Codex is a international association that um, coordinates residues or one of its sections coordinates residues in produce. Um, the people that follow codex generally don't have their own internal 
MRL system. So places like the EU, UK, um, China, US, Canada, Australia, although they may be very similar and, and identical to the Codex MRLs, they're not necessarily so because we were already have we have our own MRL setting process, APVMA in presents. Uh, US have the EPA that do it. Canada has the Pest Management Centre that does it. Um, so, and the UK have the European Commission to sort of set their own program. So, although all these agencies feed, feed into Codex, um, Codex is followed by lots of smaller countries, particularly lots of Asian countries, they'll follow Codex rather than setting their own systems. But what APVMA does is, and I'll pick this fictitious example again, we've used fluazepop in poppies. Poppies is a bad example. Let's use fluazepop in hemp for hemp seed for food. We will provide that information to Codex. If it gets ratified within Codex, it will be an MRL for fluazepop in hemp seed. So Australia, Australia through APVMA and other consultants uh, and Fazants co uh, collaborate with Codex. Excellent, thank you. Um, can you give a quick sort of brief overview of what the process might look like when it's not, um, uh, so when it's a sort of a non pesticide product like a PGR or, or something like that? Yeah, um, or a biological agent. So, so yeah. A biological, uh, let's, and um, yeah, it's APV may view biologicals and biopesticides no different than conventional pesticides. That's the blatant fact. The bit that may change, sorry, the bit that does change is the health section and in some cases the environmental part and the toxicology part. Um, but from requiring crop safety, efficacy, um, if it's a new product, then public health and human health and environment, until those things get ticked off, it's treated just as a pesticide, um, mm. particularly for new stuff. So, for example, BT, Dipel and different products. like BT has been around for 20 years. If we wanted to put Dipel or BT into a new crop, or as, as long as it's, as long as it's, um, the pests that are on the label, so Lepidoptera, uh, Halicoverpers um, species, then all you need to do is apply for a permit. You don't need any data because the the crop it has no crop safety issues in any crop. Environmental, we already know about. Um, human health, we already know about, has no residues. So it's just straight in apply for a permit. But if you go for something, um, something new and novel, and I can't think of one off the top of my head at the moment, you may need to provide that additional data. Or it might need to come from a source somewhere. Yeah, excellent. Um, and so with PGRs, how's that sit? Oh, sorry, PGRs. Uh, okay, we've applied. Thank God. PG, uh, um, the two permits to give us the most grief are herbicides and PGRs. Um, herbicides, particularly if it's soil applied, because we need to have the time of application and potentially the residues in food and the impact on the crop. And particularly we say, okay, we're going to use glyphosate through a shielded sprayer. We still have to do residue testing in case there's some drift. So herbicides give us some grief. PGRs give us a lot of grief, particularly if it goes into a new crop, because we need to have data that shows if we're using it in year one, what happens when you top up with a second dose in year two and top up with a third dose in year three? So we've got to monitor for three years. And what happens if, in another scenario, if you top up, if you spray it in year one, what happens to the crop in year two? Is there still a residual effect? And what happens in year three is the effect's gone. So it's a longevity of data, uh, so data over a, a length of time that we need for PGRs, hence because they're plant growth regulators. Um, so that's that one, it's difficult to get those across unless we've got data from elsewhere in the world. Now, we've done things like um, 
ethophon in walnuts. Ethophon is a growth regulator in walnuts. We've done several growth regulators in walnuts. We've been able to get data out of California uh, where all the walnuts are grown over there. So that's so it doesn't mean we have to do it in Australia, but we need the information. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, and and um, you touched on this a little earlier um, with the Victorian regulatory environment and um, pesticides. Can you just explain in a little more depth why that difference exists? Yeah, can you can you scroll down centers? a couple of uh, can you scroll down a couple of overheads to the one that's a table, please, Ozzy. Uh, Yes, in the sorry, in the presentation. In the presentation, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. So, oh. okay. um, just to explain to people, um, APVMA regulates the product from manufacture to the first point of sale. Fazans regulates the product or the residues. Of that, of that, of those product on the food. So that's where those two separate. Control of use legislation is set by the states. There's no national control of use legislation, although it's in the wings. Most states allow you to use, or all states allow you to use the product according to the label. But if a label says New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, doesn't mean you, you, that means you're not allowed to use it in Tasmania. So that's set by the states. Now, the re they're generally older labels, and the reason that would have happened in the past is because that crop wasn't grown in Tasmania. So that's the reason why Tasmania was left. It was very specific per thing. That tends, states don't tend to exist on labels anymore in most cases, particularly newer labels. The other thing about control of use is that, um, so the states determine it, and one thing that Victoria allowed for which is that pale blue section, so the second line, Victoria allows a use on a different crop not listed on a label. So you can go and use a product registered in apples on your poppies and hemp. You can go and use a product registered in wheat on your onions. As long as that product is registered in your state. So let's use an example. Let's use a real example. Um, I can't think of a real example. I'm going to make one up again. Apologies. Um, let's say that uh, there's a wheat herbicide um, and it's registered for Western Australia only. Where the, so, sorry, and it's. Um, no, that's not a good example. I can't think of one. So I'll have to skip the example because I can't think of a good one. Um, a product. So what Victoria allows you to do is use any product registered in the state that's not registered on the crop. So you can go, as I say, use, um, you can go and use a wheat fungicide on your apples with the proviso that there are no residues at harvest. The key part being no residues at harvest. The grower who uses it is responsible for any crop damage. If there are residues at harvest, because he has to report the use, he has to show that there's no residues at harvest. So he has to have his produce residue tested. So although it sounds a good system, it's it's open to um, lots of problems if you don't do residue testing. There is a change, and it's been going on for a long time, to have a national control of use legislation. Um, and what they were proposing, and I'm preempting here a little bit, is that you can only use products according to the label. So that condition within Victoria will change, other than for minor crops. Okay. Um, and then minor crops, you, you, they, what, we're trying to work out how that will work for, well, respecify minor crops. So cereals, Bar, uh, cereals, pine fruit, stone fruit, you can't do off label, which you can now in Victoria. Um, but I'm not sure how that includes the minor crops if you still then have to go down the permit track or what, I don't know. And that's been that's been in discussion for more than 10 years, getting a national system going. Cool. So just, just rounding that out again slightly. So that residue testing, is that reported just to the state government or is that 
sector, is that covered through a quality program like Fresh Care? It's through a QA, QA, QA system. Yeah, the QA system. Okay. Yeah. So, so looking at the difference, say, with Fresh Care applied in Victoria and TAS for the same crop, Fresh Care in TAS would be concerned with how it's being used on a label or not, and if there's yeah. a permit in place for a non label use. Whereas in Victoria, Fresh Care wouldn't really be concerned about the label use necessarily, but they would be delving into the residue testing and, and yeah, understanding. Yeah, yeah. That's and, and to have the product legally available for sale, that off-label use product X needs to have nil residues anyway, or nil detectable residues anyway. So it needs to be a zero in that column anyway. If there's any mm. figure in that column, it's a violation. Cool. Right, before we wrap, Naomi, did you have any further questions come through to you? No? No? Excellent. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for that. Um, and apologies for going over time, but hopefully thank you Hi. for those who've been able to stick with us. But I think there were some really good questions that came up that we needed to get answered while we had you on the line. Um, so yeah, once again, we've got the handouts available. Um, We'll have the webinar recording available shortly. Any questions, any queries, just reach out to myself um, through the normal social channels and, and email, et cetera. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Naomi. Um, and thanks to Ford Innovation for the VentureNet funding. Um, so yeah, we'll just close that up now. Please fill in the survey. It's really valuable data that we gather from that and will help us make sure that we continue to deliver some quality webinars and other extension events um, in the coming years. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.